Good afternoon. How is everyone today? Welcome to UCF and the Kurdish Political Studies Program. We want to welcome our special guests uh, who have literally come from places around the world, including Dr. Nashmaldeen Karim, who is the founder of the Kurdish Political Studies and Battle Chair here at UCF and the inspiration for the program. So uh, we're glad to have all of you here for uh, today's discussion about current political issues. We have some special guests. Um, I'm going to minimize my time up here because I'm actually going to focus on content. So uh, we're glad that you're here, and I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ganesh Tajour, our uh, Jalal Talabani and uh, chairholder in the British Political Studies, to come up and continue the program. Last year in October, we had the inaugural ceremony for the chair, and I would have to say that it has been a quite busy year for the program, for the College of Business program. Uh, for you who are maybe for the first time you are hearing about the program, it is the only such program in the entire country dedicated to the study of the Kurdish politics and Kurdistan, and it's based in politics science department. Uh, we have lots of activities nowadays going on, and as you will see. He will basically, our first student fellow, who will be basically have a small ceremony today. Uh, first of all, I would like to basically say a couple of words about Dr. Uh, Nejvetin Karim. Uh, as John Bersa was mentioning, he is basically the person who made this program and this chair possible. So we are basically very grateful to him uh, for his support. Uh, Dr. Karim is actually a neurosurgeon by training, and it, it may sound interesting, but actually he went to medical school in Musul, which is always in the news nowadays. Uh, he went to Iran uh, when the Kurdish rebellion in Iraq was defeated for a while in the 1970s. I believe he came to United States in 1976. So he basically established himself as a very successful doctor, but also a very important uh, person in DC uh, regarding Kurdish and Middle Eastern politics. Later on, after the liberation of Iraq in 2003, uh, he went back to his own country. Since 2011, he is the governor of Kirkuk, and if you know something about the Middle Eastern politics, I think you will recognize that Kirkuk is one of the most contested cities in the world, and obviously you will hear uh, his remarks, but just two weeks ago, there was some violence going on there, and you can appreciate the challenges he's facing as the governor of this very important city. So please welcome uh, Dr. Kirim to UCF. And I, as just mentioned, um, we basically established this fellowship in the name of Dr. Nejma and Karim. And I get very good applicants from uh, uh, many different students. And I will basically, it's my pleasure to announce that uh, Kellen Ritter, Kellen, please, he is chosen as the uh, first uh, Dr. Nejma and Karim fellow in the College of Public Studies. Thank you. 
John, is John still here? Yeah, yeah. we must have a class. Uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of distinguished uh, professors here. I want to thank you all for, for being here, Kirsten, and uh, the rest of uh, your colleagues. Uh, like uh, it was mentioned, uh, I live in Kirkuk. I'm governor of Kirkuk. Kirkuk is one of the disputed territories uh, in Iraq, which means it's disputed between the central government and the Kurdistan regional government. There are several disputed territories that are originally the, the, the land is considered uh, part of Kurdistan, uh, but demographic changes has happened, so there are other uh, ethnic groups that live with the Kurds there, but the Kurds are still the majority, and the most important of those uh, 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 territories that's considered disputed, uh, or what's called disputed territory, is Kirkuk. Of course, when I say this, somebody sitting here might think, might think that, no, there are other as important places. Uh, uh, Ms. Bayan Rahman is from Sinjar, which is also considered a, a, a disputed territory. It was in the news, as you may know, when Daesh took over the city and uh, uh, killed thousands of Yazidis, and there are still thousands of those who are missing, and you may have just heard that a young lady who was captured by ISIS and abused and everything just received the European Human Rights Award named after Andrei Zakharov, uh, which, is, uh, which is something that tells you about the, uh, the struggle of these people and what they have gone through under ISIS. Uh, Kirkuk has always been a major target for ISIS. Uh, there has been uh, several attacks, very heavy attacks on Kirkuk by ISIS in October of 2014, uh, then in January of 2015, and just three, uh, on the uh, 21st of October last month, uh, there was another big attack, uh, this time on the city. But the other ones were to get into the city, but this time they were able to sneak into the city. Seven groups, uh, they had different targets. And uh, fortunately, our security forces, uh, our police, our uh, uh, Asayish forces, which are the uh, security forces of the Kurdistan region, uh, and also our anti-terrorism unit, were able to apprehend all of these people. And our uh, forensic medicine department has the bodies of 94 of these people in the morgue. And I think they just buried them two days ago. Uh, when I was on my way here. Uh, this, a similar attack like hap what happened in uh, October 21st. Actually, that's when Mosul completely surrendered with three divisions of the Iraqi army, a division of the uh, federal police, and 29,000 local police. Uh, Kirkuk was able to uh, stand up to the terrorists, uh, we did pay a price for defending our city. We lost maybe seven people between security forces and, and civilians. But uh, Kirkuk remains safe. Uh, the other attacks uh, were just as severe. And in all the fronts where ISIS has uh, confronted uh, forces from Kurdistan, the biggest losses has been inflicted upon them in Kirkuk. In January, they lost more than 100, and they left the bodies in the fields. And uh, to an extent also in October of 2014. Uh, of course, as you know, what's in the news today is, uh, is Mosul. Mosul is uh, the second largest city in Iraq. Uh, like Kirkuk, Mosul is also multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-sect. And uh, the forces are making good progress. And it's for the first time in the history of Iraq that the Peshma, the Kurdish forces, are actually cooperating with the Iraqi forces to evict ISIS from uh, uh, Mosul. In Kirkuk, we still have part of our province, which is called Hawiji, in the southwest part of the city, that's controlled by uh, ISIS. Uh, and hopefully, once Mosul is done, we will get rid of those as well. Uh, of course, whenever you talk about the Kurdish issue, you cannot just isolate it to uh, what's going on in Iraq. Uh, Iraq itself is going through a lot of challenges. We still have political differences. Uh, we don't have a very functioning government. Our parliament 
facing fiscal crisis, facing uh, uh, war with ISIS. Well, they got themselves busy last week with uh, banning uh, use and sale of alcohol. This just tells you where priorities are in this, uh, in this situation. But that's where we live. That's the place where we live in. Uh, and of course, in neighboring Syria, in neighboring Syria, you know, the Kurdish forces are the only effective force that's fighting ISIS, that have been able to evict ISIS from territories and control those territories, and establishment of an uh, administration in those areas that's a mix of all ethnic and religious groups, and it's actually functioning quite well. Uh, we just heard, we just heard last week, how in Turkey, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, after the coup d'etat of July 15, 2000, uh, uh, 2016, this year, uh, hundred, tens of thousands of people have been arrested. Journalists have been arrested. Newspapers have been shut down. New, uh, news media such as television, including Kurdish television, has been completely closed off. Uh, and we just heard uh, last week that 11 members of the uh, parliament of Turkey were being elected by the people of the Kurdistan region of Turkey. They have been put in prison because they have a martial law and the prison thinks he can put anybody in jail or anything he wants to do, he can do it and get away with it. And to an extent, he has gotten away with it. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, many elected mayors in the Kurdish cities of Turkey have been uh, uh, arrested and replaced by others who have been appointed by the uh, AKP party, which is the uh, ruling party in Turkey. So our people are, uh, are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, and let me not forget about what's uh, going on in Iran. Uh, about more than 50% of the, those who are executed in Iran are Kurds. And for reasons using the internet or doing something differently. Uh, so we're facing a lot of challenges. We just had a... Uh, an election here uh, two days ago. Uh, we will have a new president in January. Uh, I think the policies of, uh, that has been uh, conducted in the Middle East has basically uh, sidelined the Kurds in a lot of things, although uh, whenever, whenever forces are needed, uh, the, the powers in Europe and the United States, they turn to the Kurds for help, but when they are done with them, they have left uh, uh, basically abandoned and uh, nothing is followed. We have seen many examples of this in 1975 when the Kurds were used by the United States and the Shah of Iran against uh, the Iraqi government and then abandoned when they were no longer needed. We saw that in 1991 when it was called upon the Iraqi people and the Kurdish people to rise up to get rid of that dictator. I remember the president saying that. And then, of course, uh, they allowed the Iraqi military to use its air power, to use its uh, tanks and everything to uh, uh, kill tens of thousands of people. And we are, what we are hoping for is our new president, our new administration will look at this uh, very seriously because I believe that Kurdistan is a friend of the United States. The Kurdish people are friends of the uh, American people and probably I'm not talking about Israel, but after, uh, if, you, if you take that out, and maybe to an extent even more than that, the Kurds are the best friends of the United States. I hope you all help by getting in touch with your representatives, write to them so they don't forget the Kurds, and thank you very much for coming, and um, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. to have uh, Ms. Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman, who is the representative of the Kurdistan regional government to the United States. I mean, you will hear from her, but ultimately it means that for those of you who are not very familiar with the sovereign state system, at the moment there are, I think, 193 members of the United Nations. Kurdistan is not, not one of them, taking the speaking, but if you basically ever visit Erbil, Suleymaniyah, Kerkuk, Dohuk, you will basically get the impression that this is basically already a country by itself. 
So Baya Sami Abdul Rahman is actually an ambassador of the country, the United States. Um, she's actually, maybe a bit like many other Kurdish people, has a very kind of tumultuous uh, past. She was born in Baghdad. Uh, for a while, she was in exile in uh, Iran. Then she ended up going to uh, England. She finished her education in, in London. Later, she became a very successful journalist. She basically worked for the, the Observer and later for the Financial Times. And this is the interesting connection. She was actually in Japan. She was the uh, Financial Times Tokyo correspondent for a long time. And before being the represented to the DC, she was actually serving the Kurdish Sanitary Government in London. And, um, and as I told you, I mean, she comes from a very important family. Her father uh, was one of the leaders of the um, Kurdish movement in Iraq. And unfortunately, in 2004, uh, he lost his life in a twice suicide bombing in uh, Kurdistan. So, and I mean, if you basically get Kurds better over time, you always basically see all these tragic stories and how basically their experience has been so painful, basically uh, in the late 20th century. And you can always hope that in the 21st century, this experience will not be replicated. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Bayan Abdul Rahman to UCF. Sources of uh, oil that they've been able to sell. 
both in Mosul, uh, excuse me, both in Iraq and in Syria as well. The security challenge that this posed for the Kurdistan region, of course, Mosul is not in the Kurdistan region, but it's very close. Mosul historically, culturally, militarily, commercially, has been an important center in Iraq. It's Iraq's second largest city. But even under, under the Ottoman Empire, Mosul was regarded as a critical center. So it was a shock. It was a shock to all of us that Mosul could be overrun so easily. With the military equipment that ISIS seized, ISIS then started to terrorize the Christians, Shabaks, Khakis, Yazidis, the minorities that live in Mosul and in the surrounding province of Nineveh. It has committed genocide, an ongoing genocide today, against the Yazidis, the Christians, and other minorities. Today, Kurdistan region shelters almost all of the Christians and Yazidis in Iraq. They have nowhere else they feel safe. ISIS attacked Sinjar, my hometown, but also, of course, the hometown or the homeland of most of the Yazidis in, in Iraq. It overran Sinjar in August 2014. Men were beheaded, women and children were killed or taken into slavery, sexual slavery. We know that many of the young women, the girls, have been sold repeatedly among ISIS fighters. They have been taken to Syria, and we've even heard about them being taken to other parts of the Middle East. Some of the girls and the women have escaped, some have been rescued, some have just fled after enduring the most unspeakable time under ISIS. This is the kind of barbarian organization that we are dealing with. The Kurdish Peshmerga forces, the Peshmerga are the military or the legitimate army of the Kurdistan region. They have been fighting ISIS since 2014. We have a 600, more than 600 mile border with ISIS. That's a very, very long <coughs> line to be defending and protecting every single day. And every single day in the past two years, ISIS has launched suicide attacks, mortar rounds and attacks. So this is a live kinetic war. It's not a theoretical war that's many mil million miles away. At the same time, ISIS has been trying to infiltrate the displaced communities that have been fleeing their territories. And we've successfully, so far, on the whole, managed to protect against that. Our Peshmerga forces have been fighting ISIS sometimes with very, very little weaponry. We certainly don't have the same weapons as the Iraqi military. The Iraqi military, when the United States was in, uh, in Iraq, the Iraqi military was able to get equipment, training. Some of it was designated for the Peshmerga, but under Prime Minister Maliki, that weaponry was just put aside and warehouse. So when ISIS attacked, on the whole, the Peshmerga had very little equipment. They had Kashnikovs, their form of communication was their mobile phone, and uh, we were taken by surprise. We were completely unready for what happened. But fortunately, the Peshmergas regrouped and have been able to push back on ISIS. So since August 2014, when ISIS came forward in big waves in Sinjar and other places and took uh, areas that we consider to be part of Kurdistan, since August 2014, the Peshmerga have pushed back and almost all areas that we consider to be part of Kurdistan have now been liberated. In November 2015, my hometown of Sinjar was liberated and this is the homeland of the Yazidis. And it's very, very significant that Sinjar has been liberated. But unfortunately, the Yazidis haven't been able to go home. Sinjar is utterly destroyed. There are booby traps, there are IEDs, and there are no services, no electricity, water, anything that would allow a population to return home. There are mine-removing organizations working in Sinjar and elsewhere, 
but the level of mining and, and booby traps and IEDs is so high that it will take a very, very long time, or it needs a very strong push by the coalition and the UN to deal with the, the removal of these, uh, this contamination and to bring back those areas to be habited again. The issues that we face on the security front are many. One issue that I touched on is the kind of equipment that the Peshmerga have. We're very grateful to the United States, both for the airstrikes that started in August 2014 and have saved lives and have taken out ISIS leaders and strategic positions. And we're also grateful to the United States for leading a coalition and maintaining a coalition for two years and for equipping and training the Peshmerga. We still have the issue of the type of equipment that the Peshmerga have. We don't have the same type of equipment as the Iraqi military, even though Kurdistan's Peshmerga are part of the Iraq defense system. Earlier today I was saying it would be like depriving the Alaskan National Guard from equipment and training that every other member of the military in the United States gets. That's the kind of treatment that we're getting. We have asked the United States, both the Congress and the administration, to look into this and to help us by providing better equipment and also providing it direct to the Peshmerga so that it doesn't have to go through Baghdad. Of course, the United States believes in a one Iraq policy and believes that by doing this it would be undermining that policy. That's debatable, but that's their position. So what the State Department has pledged is that no equipment that is destined for the Peshmerga will be delayed by Baghdad. And we are looking to them to maintain that status. Right now, the Peshmerga and the Iraqi security forces and the mobilization units are all engaged in the liberation of Mosul. The Peshmerga have already liberated over 500 square miles. There have been people killed, Peshmerga killed and wounded in this most recent operation. And of course the Iraqi security forces as well. The role of the Peshmerga has been to tighten the noose on the city of, Pe uh, of Mosul but not to go into Mosul. Going into Mosul is really the role of the Iraqi security forces, and they're beginning to do that. We expect the fight for Mosul to take weeks, maybe even months, but of course the, the sooner that it's dealt with, the better. ISIS is using every possible tactic that you could think of. It has used chemical weapons, it's, used, it's burning heavy fuel, so that it can use a, create a kind of a smoke screen. It is using suicide bombers, vehicle bombs, suicide bombers on vehicles. It is using tunnels to launch surprise attacks. It is using human shields, so the civilians in Mosul are being used as human shields. And we're hearing about mass executions, where ISIS is executing people en masse in public to make an example and to deter the population from rising up or siding with the liberating forces. But there are very clear signs of resistance within the population in Mosul. So, moving on from the security challenge, and the security challenge will continue after the liberation of Mosul. Once Mosul is liberated, hopefully, then Hawija, as Dr. Najmuddin Karim said, will be liberated and ISIS will be pushed out in terms of holding any territory in Iraq. But we believe that the terrorist threat will continue in Iraq, but in a different form. So the security challenge will be there beyond the liberation of Mosul. Moving on from that, and talking about the humanitarian crisis that we face, even before ISIS came, Kurdistan was facing a huge humanitarian challenge. And this was because of the civil war or the conflict in Syria. The population of Kurdistan is about 5 million. Around 2012, 
we started to re receive waves and waves of displaced or, re or refugees from Syria, people fleeing the conflict there. Currently, we have about 300,000 Syrian refugees in Iraq. 97% of them are in Kurdistan. So when this was happening before ISIS, we thought, this is a huge humanitarian crisis. How can we manage? My God, this is terrible. And then, of course, ISIS came in 2014 and began this campaign of genocide. And the number of displaced people that have come to Kurdistan region is about 1.5 million. They are Sunni Arabs, Shia Arabs, Turkmen, Yazidis, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Christians, Kurds, every nationality, every ethnicity, Shabaks, Kakes, Sabin, Mandeans, every possible makeup component of Iraq has fled ISIS and has taken shelter in, in Kurdistan. Kurdistan shelters 40 to 50 percent of all of the displaced people in Iraq. And as I said earlier, 97 percent of the Syrian refugees in Iraq are in Kurdistan region. So we are bearing a huge responsibility. And this is having a huge impact on our, on our economy and on our society. Our population has jumped up, a huge increase in population in a very short period of time. I ask you to think about your hometown or your home state of Florida. Can you imagine a 30% increase in your population in a very short period of time? How would your hospitals cope? How would your electricity supply, your water supply, hygiene services, how would all of that cope? How would you, as a citizen, cope with such a vast influx of people? In some parts of Kurdistan, the refugees and the displaced outnumber the locals. In some areas, it's one to one. In other areas, the ratio of the host population is higher. But I'm just trying to give you the picture of what it's like day to day to have an influx of refugees and displaced people. And don't forget that they are the most vulnerable. They have no work, they have no income, they have children, there are pregnant women about to give birth, they have elderly people with heart conditions, with cancer, we have to take care of all of them. So this has created a situation where the host community, ordinary members of the public in the Kurdistan region, have taken on the responsibility to feed a family, to maybe take care of a camp. I know of some wealthy businessmen in Kurdistan who have taken it on themselves to provide the food for small camps. By small, I mean about a thousand people. Imagine that, feeding a thousand people every day at your own expense. So this has been a very humbling experience for someone like me to see my fellow Kurdistanis rise up and take everybody in and welcome them and provide them with water, with food and with accommodation. The majority of the displaced people are not in camps. They are hosted within the community. Those who can afford it have rented apartments. Those who cannot have either just found shelter with a local family. Some are housed in half-finished buildings, construction sites. Some have just taken refuge on the side of the road. I believe about 30% or so are in camps. So their situation is dire. It's two years since most of them arrived. So imagine after two years, even if you're in a tent, your tent is now becoming threadbare. The United Nations has never been able to raise enough money for its flash appeals and its emergency appeals in Iraq. So the UN has always struggled to feed all of the displaced and the refugees to find uh, health care and, and to support us in what we're doing for them. Right now, 55% of displaced children are not in school. So imagine what that means for the future of our country. 55% of those displaced children not in school. 
The humanitarian crisis has also had a huge impact on our, on our economy. As I said, our population jumped up, it, it rose by 30% in a very short period of time. At the same time, we haven't been receiving our budget from Baghdad. We used to be, or we are, entitled to 17% of Iraq's budget. We never really received 17%, but we used to receive something. Since 2014, that has more or less stopped. So while we're fighting a very expensive war, the expense of logistics, feeding, sheltering, um, and taking care of 1.8 million refugees and displaced people, while we're doing all of that, we haven't received our budget from Baghdad. So our economy has taken a dive in the past two years. Kurdistan used to be described as the gateway to Iraq's economy. It was a thriving place. We were attracting foreign direct investment by the billions of dollars. We started an oil industry from scratch in 2007 when we passed the law, the Kurdistan oil law. So we were going forwards. We were expanding our economy. There were many issues that we neglected to deal with in our economy, but I think we were in a very optimistic period. And so all of that progress, we built schools, we built roads, all of that is now suspended. There are thousands of public works projects, government projects to build hospitals, schools, roads, all of the kind of infrastructure that governments usually provide. Thousands of these projects have been suspended are, and are incomplete because we just don't have the money. We're focusing the money, number one, on security, number two, on the humanitarian crisis. So there's very little left to continue boosting the economy. We've also been hit by a sharp fall in oil prices. Uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, the oil price was well over $100 per barrel. Today, I believe it's around $45 dollars per barrel, but it went way below that in early 2016. Our economy is largely reliant on oil, so the oil price has a direct impact on the economy, on our ability to take care of our population, and also the displaced population. We've learned our lesson. Uh, we knew that we shouldn't be reliant on oil before ISIS came along, but we didn't do enough to deal with that. But certainly now there is a very clear recognition that we need to change and diversify our economy. We have an agreement with the World Bank uh, which has mapped out a path to economic reform for the Kurdistan region. And we've asked the World Bank to stay the course with us, not just to help us draw up the map, but also to guide us and be with us as we implement reform. This is for many reasons, one, to make sure that we implement it correctly, but also to assure the Kurdish public and also our friends abroad that we are committed to this, that we are determined to revive our economy, but also to put our economy on a stronger footing. One of the challenges that we face is that our government over employs. We have a very, very large public service, uh, far too many people, some people who receive two salaries but actually only do one job. So these are areas also that we're trying to reform. Very recently the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister became the first government employees to be biometrically registered. So now anyone who receives a government salary has to be biometric, biometrically registered as a way of ensuring that they only receive the one salary that they are eligible to receive. So there are many projects like that that we're trying to implement to reform the economy. We are also committed to uh, encouraging the private sector to take a greater role in Kurdistan's economy. This also brings me on to the political situation that we're facing. One of the reasons that our economy has been hit, as I said earlier, is because we haven't had our budget from Baghdad for
for over two years, actually coming up to nearly three years. And this is really a symptom of a dysfunctional relationship between Erbil and Baghdad. There are many reasons for it. Uh, there were many steps taken by the previous <coughs> Prime Minister that alienated some of the Kurdish leadership. Um, even with Prime Minister Abadi at the helm, we have seen some improvements, certainly, but some of the promises that were made have not been implemented or delivered on. We also face the challenge in Iraq that every single community with a political representation is disunited and fragmented. Whether you're talking about the Shia bloc, the Sunni bloc in Baghdad, the Kurdish bloc, within Kurdistan there is political disunity. Within the Yazidi community there is political disunity. The same with the Christians. Every single community in Iraq that has some kind of a political voice is disunited and fragmented. And this is going to mean that we face many, many challenges. After the liberation of Mosul, how are we all going to live together? What is going to happen the day after the liberation of Mosul? How will Mosul itself be governed? What about the province of Nineveh, where Mosul lies, where most of the minorities call home? How can those Yazidis and Christians go home when Frankly, some of their neighbors encouraged ISIS or showed ISIS the homes of Yazidis and Christians so that they could be beheaded and raped and enslaved. How can those Yazidis and Christians go back home knowing that this is what their neighbors did to them? Or even just feel safe that another ISIS will not come back? These are questions that have not been addressed, but they are what lies ahead of us. On a wider scale, what is the relationship between Erbil and Baghdad going to be? What is the status of the disputed territories going to be? How will Kirkuk, Sinjar, other areas that are disputed, how will they now be dealt with? Almost all of them are now under Peshmerga control, but we still need to have some kind of dialogue with Baghdad to resolve these issues. So the relationship, as I said, has been largely dysfunctional. But very recently, we've had some very positive breakthroughs. In September and October, there have been some high-level meetings between Baghdad and Erbil. And just in the past few days, Prime Minister Abadi made a visit to Erbil. So there have been some very good moves and positive agreements made. Of course, it's the implementation that always is the challenge, but at least right now, there's a great deal of goodwill, there is cooperation on the front line in Mosul, and there is an agreement between Erbil and Baghdad to create a high-level committee that will address these outstanding issues between us and Baghdad. But really, we have many challenges ahead of us. How will we all live together in Iraq? Who will govern Mosul and how? What will happen to the minorities that are undergoing genocide? How will they feel protected and safe? And I think this is where the United States can help us. I know that Americans are sick and tired of Iraq. I know that you have given a great deal of blood and treasure, and many of you wish that Iraq would just disappear. I'm sorry, but Iraq is here, and we need continued American leadership on the question of Iraq. And we have a new administration about to take its seat in Washington. We have a new Congress about to start. And what we will be asking, both the administration and Congress and the people of America, is to stay engaged with Iraq. Look beyond Mosul. Without American leadership, it will be much, much more difficult we don't want a vacuum to be left in Iraq. That doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities. Absolutely. The responsibility is for us to put our house in order. But sometimes you need a, a voice to push you, to guide you, to also be a kind of a protective presence. 
against some of the other forces that there are within the region. So we need the United States to remain engaged diplomatically, and also I would say militarily. As I said earlier, liberating Mosul from ISIS will be a huge achievement, but it won't be the end of terrorism in Iraq. And we need US engagement to help us maintain stability and help us to work out these differences and political issues, some of which are very, very deep-rooted. We need the US to remain engaged. We need other allies as well, of course, not just the United States. But we don't want the coalition to completely shift its focus to Syria whilst Mosul is liberated and then wave us goodbye. Currently, our relationship with the United States is very strong. It's very detailed. I would say perhaps more detailed than it has been at any point. The United States is helping the Peshmerga by training, advising, sharing intelligence, helping us with the airstrikes, helping us in our coordination in the fight to the in Mosul. And we need that to continue. The US is also the biggest donor, the biggest contributor to the United Nations in Iraq. So many of the humanitarian projects in Iraq and in Kurdistan are indirectly funded by the United States. We're very grateful to America, but we want America to stay engaged. And I think you'll find that the minorities, the Yazidis and the Christians, will also be calling for the United States to remain engaged. I know for a fact that the Christians are already asking that Nineveh province should be carved out into maybe two or even three provinces so that they can have their own administrative area, their own autonomous area in Iran because they don't feel safe to be under anybody else. So these are all issues that we need to look at going forwards and I would urge the United States to stay the course. Our relationship with the United States is currently primarily focused on the security and humanitarian areas. But we are trying to broaden that. We want the United States to be engaged with us commercially, culturally, in terms of exchanges with our universities, our students, and many other areas. And our mission in Washington, D.C. is trying to broaden the conversation so we're not always just talking about security and humanitarian crises. Just this month, later this month, we will have a conference in Washington focusing on the economy in Kurdistan. And these are the kinds of conversations that we're trying to have with the United States, with companies, with businesses, and we're also trying to get out of Washington as much as we can so that we can meet people outside of the Beltway. So the last point that I want to really focus on is the future of Kurdistan. Is the future of, when I say the future of Kurdistan, of course I'm focusing on Iraqi Kurdistan. Of course there are Kurds in Iran, Turkey and Syria as well. And many of us are linked by blood. It's not just a theoretical link, it's a true blood and belonging link that we have. But in this context, I'm the representative of the Kurdistan region in Iraq, and I will limit my comments to that area. What is the future of Kurdistan in Iraq? Will we continue to remain a region within Iraq? Will we have a more loose confederation, a looser federal arrangement with Iraq? Or will we have an independent state that is today part of Iraq? that will be independent. Every Kurd wants an independent homeland, and it is our right, just as it is every other people's right, to have self-determination. I personally believe that we will have an independent Kurdistan. I don't know when, but I'm confident that my children will have Kurdish passports one day. The question is, how do we achieve that? We want to achieve it through dialogue and through peaceful means. We've already started the conversation in Baghdad. It's something that we talk about publicly. There is no hidden agenda. It's all out there in the public. And I ask you to think about the Middle East, 
and the world with an independent Kurdistan as part of it. I believe that Kurdistan is a reliable partner to the United States. The Peshmerga have already proven so. The Kurdistan region is a bulwark against extreme, Islamist extremism. The Kurdistan region has become, has become the safe haven for every religious and ethnic minority. So I believe Kurdistan has shared values with the United States and is an effective and reliable partner. So I ask you to keep in mind that the future will have an independent Kurdish state. I don't know when, but your generation will see it. And you should keep that in mind when you are fulfilling your studies, when you're talking to members of Congress, when you yourselves have become leaders in your own field. It will be something that will come across your desk, so be ready for it. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, for listening, and I'd like to thank Gunesh and Dr. Najmuddin Kerry for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, you spoke a little bit um, on the, uh, the World Bank's uh, discussion about the, the future of the economy in Kurdistan. I was wondering if you would elaborate just a little bit more about what that discussion entails. Yeah, I have a very uh, simple question with a simple answer that I, I think it's, it's a takeaway. I think the answer is going to be a takeaway for this crowd of young Americans when they leave here. Very simple question, and it's this. Has any American soldier ever died on Kurdish-controlled soil by enemy hand? Uh, about 
40,000 people have been displaced since the 17th, no, excuse me, yes, yes, since the 17th of October when the Mosul operation began, about 40,000 people have been displaced and the vast majority have headed towards Kurdistan. So these are people who have fled the surrounding villages of Mosul and they have nothing. They literally just have the clothes that they're wearing on their backs. Um, we know that ISIS, as I said earlier, is trying to use human shields, has executed people. I heard just today that they electrocuted some people in a public square as a kind of a warning to people not to side with the liberating forces. So for the people that are stuck living under ISIS, it's very, very difficult. There is a radio station set up in Kurdistan that uh, a lot of people in Mosul call into. And they're risking their lives because mobile phones are banned under ISIS. So just having a mobile phone and then phoning into a radio station would get you killed. But people do it. And they will phone into the radio station and they, they say their life is unbearable. Since the liberation operation began, uh, 17th of October, many people don't dare step out of their homes. And uh, I've listened to some of the, the phone-ins into this radio station and people are saying things like, God forbid if my baby falls ill, I can't take them to hospital because I can't leave at the home because of the threat of ISIS and the fighting. So right now, the situation for civilians is very, very difficult. And this is what makes the liberation of Musa so complicated. Uh, of course, the might of the American and coalition forces, the might of the Iraqi force, the Peshmerga, you think, well, there are only a few thousand ISIS fighters, but they're using human shields, and that's what makes things very difficult. The UN, uh, working with the Kurdistan regional government, is establishing camps to receive the displaced. We're very concerned that ISIS fighters will hide among the displaced people, and already many have been caught. Many of them dress up as women, uh, but there's a vetting procedure, a screening procedure, to make sure that only genuine displaced civilians will make it uh, to the camps. Uh, the second question is about volunteers from America, Europe, that have joined the Peshmerga. To be honest, we don't encourage and we don't discourage. Uh, we already have the Peshmerga forces. It's a voluntary army. It's not conscripted. And we are not short of Kurdish volunteers for the Peshmerga. I'm very proud to say that when many of them have not received their salaries for a long time and yet they're prepared to continue to fight. So we don't encourage Western volunteers, but some have made it there and they fight. I would say where we really need that kind of assistance is really on the medical front. Uh, we have many wounded in Kashmir, we have 9,000 in total. Uh, the ones with very severe in injuries, uh, we really can't handle within Kurdistan and some countries have taken them uh, to be treated elsewhere at their own expense, which we're very grateful for. But I would say if anybody wants to come and help, come and help the Peshmerga medically, or come and help the displaced. I mean, the displaced need everything. They need food, they need water, they need education services for their children, they need medical services. But also the psychiatric services. If you think about the trauma that everybody has been and is going through. That's really the kind of volunteer help that I would encourage. But we're very grateful, of course, to all of our friends. Would you like to add something? Uh, one of our advisory board members, Dr. Ghazi Sibari, who was here last year in the Victoria University Hospital in Louisiana, he actually takes a group of American doctors to Kurdistan every year. And I believe he will do the same thing in May, if not before that. So yes, that's right. Reason. So the questions on the World Bank and economic diversity. So um, Kurdistan Regional Government came out with a document, I believe it was in 2013, called Vision 2020. It's still available on the main KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government website. 
Vision 2020 was our vision for how we wanted Kurdistan's economy to be in 2020. And there was a focus set out in that document to diversify from oil and gas. Uh, that was already in our plan. It was already in our plan to encourage the private sector to take a greater role in the economy. Right now, almost every university graduate wants a job in the government. Whereas in the United States, I assume most of you will go into the private sector. And as a graduate of London University, I never thought about working for the government. So this is the, we need to change that kind of mindset to make the private sector more attractive. Right now, if you work for the government, maybe not today because the economy is bad, but generally speaking, if you work for the government, you have a secured pension and so on and so on. We're trying to find ways for the private sector to offer similar packages, while the government should be employing far fewer people. So Vision 2020 set out a lot of these ideas already. Um, the areas of, the, of industry that we want to focus on to diversify from oil and gas, tourism, agriculture, and manufacturing are some of the ones that I can mention. The, the list is actually longer than that in the document. Why tourism and agriculture? Kurdistan was the breadbasket of Iraq historically. Uh, we have fertile lands, we have rivers, we have snow, rainfall. And the agricultural sector got decimated under Saddam Hussein. Um, he destroyed four and a half thousand villages. That's nearly all of the villages. Only 500 villages survived Saddam Hussein's genocide campaign. And of course, he banned or prohibited farming. So all agricultural industry stopped by the late 80s. There was nothing. In the 90s, when we had the no-fly zone and the Kurdistan region was able to breathe a little bit, the UN Oil for Food program kicked in, where Iraq's oil was sold and the money given uh, to humanitarian and food provision, and those kinds of services. Unfortunately, the UN Oil for Food program had to deal with Saddam because the UN only operates with the sovereign state. And there was an agreement between the UN and Saddam that rather than buy wheat and barley and fruit and vegetables from Kurdish farmers who were producing again, they would import it. So, first we had the destruction caused by the genocide, then we had the UN Oil for Food Program really putting the nail in the coffin of the agricultural sector. And we have gone from the agriculture sector in the 70s, the mid-70s, employing two-thirds of the Kurdish workforce. Today, maybe 5%, maybe even fewer than that. And we have the land, we have the history, but it's very difficult to get the workforce interested again. And anyway, the agriculture sector has moved on. Now it's mechanized, now there's technology. So this is one of the sectors that we believe we can focus on. Tourism is another area. It might sound crazy because we're part of Iraq and everyone's image of Iraq is not very good. Deservedly or undeservedly, that's the reality if you're a tourist. Um, and also, we're fighting ISIS. But really, if you go up to 2013, even beginning of 2014, Kurdistan was receiving hundreds of thousands of tourists, mostly from Iraq and neighboring countries. But we also had tour packages, tourist groups coming from the United States, Canada, Australia, Britain, and other European countries. And in January 2014, Erbil was designated the tourist capital of the Arab world, ironically. Um, but of course, we never were able to implement anything back here because of ISIS came along. So tourism is another sector that we believe we can revive. And with everything that's been happening in the past two years with ISIS and Mosul, tourism has never stopped. It might sound strange, the numbers, of course, have reduced sharply but we still get tourism from our neighboring countries. So these are areas that were highlighted in the Vision 2020 document. The document is still there. 
it is still a worthwhile document, even though, as I said earlier, thousands of projects have been suspended because we don't have the money. But I think the document became the basis for the World Bank's uh, path to economic reform, which has already been published. I think it came out in June 2016. And now we're beginning to get into the implementation phase. One of the things that we need to do is to reduce the size of the government as an employer. We're already doing that. Other things are encouraging the private sector, focusing on these er other areas of uh, industry. So General Ordino's question, has a member of the coalition ever been killed in Kurdistan? The answer is no. Uh, in our history, ever, we've never had an insurgency against American, British, or any other liberating forces. I'm talking since 2003. Uh, I know that sadly many American soldiers were killed elsewhere in Iraq, but not in Kurdistan, and I used to often see young American soldiers going to the supermarkets in Dahog at Beel to when they were on their RMR. This is where they would go. And uh, we're very proud of that record, and we wish to maintain it, and I think you'll find that Americans are most welcome in Kurdistan. I think we can get a couple more questions. I think it's a question, but so I mean obviously we had the elections just um, two days ago and even in this country which is always the one of the most developed countries in the world there's a special on the last year. So I just want to get your first reflections as a very high ranking diplomat and basically for why the most important was uh, in foreign affairs for Kurdistan, in the sense that uh, what will your personal perspective regarding the ability of women to occupy key leadership positions uh, in Kurdistan, obviously in a region which is not necessarily characterized by either of the Thank you for that. Um, I would give Kurdistan a mixed report card. I think in some ways we do a great deal to protect women's rights, to promote women. Uh, there are many examples. We have a quota for our parliament. So at least 30% of members of parliament have to be women. And this has forced the political parties to find women that can represent them. Um, I know there are many women who despise quotas, but I personally think they work because it's forcing our very traditional political parties to nurture women, educate them in how to uh, create policy, how to do PR, how to argue and debate. So we have these policies like that. We have uh, banned FGM. We have very progressive family laws, but we still have to stay within the framework of Islam, which can be a very difficult balancing act. For example, we can't ban polygamy because it's allowed in Islam, but we have made it very, very, very difficult. So th these are the, the positives, I would say. Also, the political parties, the main political parties, have women in their leadership, uh, some by quota, some just by being elected within the party ranks. Within the government, I think the Kazakhstan regional government has always, more or less always, had female members of the cabinet. And currently, I think, two of the 14 representatives, like myself, two of the 14 representatives are female. This is all great progress. It really is, and we shouldn't dismiss it because we're talking about the Middle East, we're not talking about Sweden. And this is remarkable. When you compare us to other countries, we still have honor-based violence, we still have honor-based killings, we still have families that are very, very restrictive about their daughters and their wives. I, I want to be clear and honest with you. But what we have achieved is remarkable within a Middle East context, and particularly with the kind of extremism that we see today. But for me personally, I have, I have faced some sexism, not always from people senior to me, sometimes from people junior to me who find it 
difficult to operate under a, a female director or manager or whatever, boss, let's say. Um, and I have been in many situations where I've been the only woman in the room, and that can be very awkward. But you said earlier, I think, that I worked as a journalist in Japan. As a journalist in Japan, I was often the only woman in the room. So it's not that different, actually. Even in Britain, even in, in America, there is still this glass ceiling, as, as we've just seen. But I am proud of the achievements that we've made in Kalisan, the progress. Thank you very much.